Uh, yes, I would be more than happy to. So we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father and our God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this evening. We thank you that today we celebrate the feast of your most precious body and blood in Corpus Christi. Our Lord and our God, as we begin this faith in the public square um, program, and we choose to discuss suffering, a topic which is near and dear to a lot of our hearts, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you guide our speakers. Pray that you may send your Holy Spirit to give them the words that it is to explain the dilemma to us. We also pray for the hearts that are going to be listening to this program, that you, O Lord, will water our hearts, you will make it fertile ground to receive the word which we will get in this session, and that we will then take the word and move it further to everyone else. Our Father and our God, we bless and thank you, and we look forward to a session, a fruitful session in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everyone. There's a lot of people. I'm very excited. So my name is Blondie, and I will be the moderator today. And um, we're trying to keep to time. So it's going to be a very informal session. Um, we have three fantastic priests who will share their knowledge and try to explain to us why, you know, people suffer and why. Sorry, I think I was on mute. Um, can you hear me? Let me know if I, you can all hear me, please. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, by introducing our priests first, and then we'll get started. So first is Father Anthony Wosu, who is a priest of the Catholic Archdiocese of Lagos. He um, had his seminary education at SS Peter and Paul in Bodija and Ibadol. After that, um, he worked briefly as the assistant cathedral administrator before being appointed as the secretary to the Archdiocese of Lagos. Um, a position which he held for five years. He then proceeded to the Pontifical uh, Biblical Institute. And if I butcher these names, please correct me, right? So he also proceeded to the Pontifical Biblical Institute of Rome, where he obtained a licentiate degree in um, sacred scripture. And after his studies um, in Rome, he also moved to the UK for his PhD, which he's currently doing right now at King's College London still in biblical studies he also works as the assistant priest at saint boniface in to tooting broadway london father anthony can you correct me did i pronounce that correctly it's in broadway okay perfect okay and then our next priest is father emmanuel ojefo who is in the world religions and world church doctoral program Samantha. You'll explain to us what that is a little later. Um, and the program is a University of Notre Dame in Indiana. He's also a priest of the Catholic Archdiocese of Abuja. Prior to coming to Notre Dame in 2021, he served as the personal secretary to the Cardinal John Onayeko in Abuja as the assistant chaplain at the Chapel of Lux Terra Leadership Foundation in Abuja also, and as the chaplain at Regina Patches College, Girls College in Abuja. Father Ojefo also had his seminary training at St. Peter and Paul Major Seminary in Bodija as well. Um, he holds an MSc in Science and Religion as a Kirby Lang International Scholar at the School of Divinity in, and an, a Master's in Religion and Global Politics at the School of Oriental and African Studies in University of London. Father Manuel, I'm going to ask you, can you just give like, it's a mouthful, it's a mouthful. I think you're on mute. Okay, no, you're not. So can you just tell us, because I read a lot, but I need to understand what exactly your education. You... Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this platform this, after, this morning. It's still morning here in South Bend, Indiana. Yeah, so um, how do I explain this? So I have interest in religion and politics, intersection of religion and politics, particularly within the context of Nigeria, we see a lot of religion in politics, and we see a lot of politics in religion. So I'm trying to understand what the relationship is, the various levels of interaction between religion and politics. That was why I took the first master's in religion and politics. But then I started that master's and then I, I thought that there was another important global cultural factor. So politics is an important global cultural factor. Religion is an important global cultural factor. 
But I discovered that science too is another important global cultural factor. That science shapes a lot of perceptions, the way we understand reality, the way we understand life. Like just a couple of minutes ago, a friend sent me something that was on um, um, what's this Insta blog Niger, and it was something about okay, so Genesis tells us that Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain and Abel, and then Cain killed Abel, and then there's just Cain that is left, and then we hear that Cain got married. <laughs> so like. Where did that child come from? Yeah. So you find a lot. So science has its own interpretation about the origin of life. And then religion has its own interpretation. What we read from the Bible is not what science tells us. So I decided that, okay, it was important to go out and start to read in science and religion. So what I'm doing now with my PhD is simply to just zoom in all of this within the perspective of not just religion generally, but from the perspective of Catholic Church. So, I am in the world, religions, and world church. So it studies interaction between the religions of the world and the Catholic Church. But I am more interested in reading all of these issues from the Catholic perspective. Yeah, okay. I hope that satisfies your curiosity. Yes, it does. It does. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And our last priest is Father Belkisedek Okwala, who is a priest of the Archdiocese of Lagos as well. Archdiocese of Lagos, strong. Um, so he completed his seminary education in SS Peter and Paul Major Seminary in Abadol as well. And since his ordination, he's worked as a curate at St. Cyril Catholic Church in Okota, as the Lagos Archdiocesan Secretary and also the Secretary to Cardinal Anthony Okoje, and also as a lecturer of philosophy and theology at SS Peter and Paul Major Seminary. He also has a license licentiate in philosophy, and he's just completed his doctoral studies at the Pontifical University of um, the Holy Cross in Rome. Welcome, Father Melky, Father Emmanuel, and Father Anthony. We're really happy to have you guys here. Let me see your videos are on because we want to see your faces. Yes, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to just explain a little bit how the session will work. We have our three fantastic priests and they're going to talk to us a little bit and then we're going to open the floor to questions. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box or you can send them directly to me or to Isioma Koka as well. And um, we'll read out your questions. If you want to ask it by yourself, just let us know and we'll ask you to unmute yourself when the time comes. So we're going to open the floor with Father Anthony. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you, Blondie, Father Emmanuel, Father Melki, Isioma, Bibi, Nenda, Ifani, Ibitemi, and all of you who have put this together. I think that this is a uniquely profound question that resists an easy answer. There is no cosmetic remedy to this kind of question. No, of the counter prescription that can do justice to the profundity of this question. So it's a question that, um, that requires compassion, requires a lot of participation, empathy, and charity to even engage the question. This kind of question for me reflects the, the misery that we, we, we find ourselves in our human condition, it reflects you know, our limitation and lack of insight into the mystery of life. Uh, and underlying this question for me is, is a yearning for accountability, for, 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 for responsibility. We want someone to be responsible, someone to, to be accountable for the, for, the, for the predicament that people face. You know, some were seeking, you know, um, seeking to, to find out who is the perpetrator of this suffering. And this kind of question for me, you know, calls for a lot of humility um, uh, and patience and truth. Um, a friend of mine who lost a husband some time ago, you know, having tried to stalk her out of her pain, after tr having tried for like two or three years, and I noticed that, you know, she was still hurting. I asked her, do you think you need to forgive God? That was the only time she lit up and said, maybe. And that was the beginning of some kind of healing for her. So this is a very, you know, it's a very serious question. And engaging this question, as I said, we must also acknowledge the absolute singularity, the absolute incomprehensibility that we can't really understand so many things and immeasurability of every case 
Each case is peculiar. Each experience of suffering is unique. And so there is no one can fit all. I just thought to make a few preambulary uh, remark before I engage the question headlong. You know, and one must distinguish you know, kinds of suffering, you know, self-inflicted suffering um, in case of you know, wages of sin is, is death. So when one inflicts a suffering on oneself as a result of sin, because sin takes us further than we want to go, it keeps us longer than we want to stay, and it costs us more than we're willing to pay. So there is a suffering that results from you know, poor choice. So we make that distinction. There's also intergenerational suffering, you know, a diachronics of suffering through time. And Jesus made allusion to this in John chapter nine when they asked, is it this man that sinned or his parents? This gives an indication that there is an understanding that suffering can be intergenerational. It can be inherited. Even though Ezekiel recounted that view in Ezekiel 18, but there is an indication that if people can pass on high blood pressure, diabetes in, a, in, in biological way, also in the spiritual world, we do know that people can inherit things from their parents. So make a distinction between self-inflicted suffering, um, intergenerational suffering, the inevit inevitable suffering to live and exist is to suffer. You know, there is no escaping that. It's an essential element of our suffering, of our existence. There's no escaping that. So I think that we should also acknowledge that suffering is inevitable on account of our, our, our common humanity. Um, so there is that inevitable suffering. If you like, you can say cosmic suffering, the, the natural suffering we experience as a result of natural disaster. Then there is purgative suffering. And I'm just trying to situate this question of suffering in a broader context. A suffering that is that purifies, we prefer to call it divine chastisement. You know, the vine that yields no fruit, it prunes with care to make it yield abundant fruit. The child that God loves, he chastises. So there's that kind of purgative suffering, a suffering that purifies. Then there is inexplicable suffering. This is where we are. This suffering, you know, that you can't account for, you know, a child born with leukemia, this kind of suffering that we can't account for. So for me, I think that it's important to delineate immediately what we mean by suffering. And I also think it's important when we say people suffer, we need to put a face to, to these people. They're our friends, family members, brothers, sisters, children that we know, people we have journeyed with. So there's a face to these people. It's not so generic. I don't want to neutralize the concrete, you know, tangible character of suffering of, of which we address this evening. And we must avoid also the danger of trying to, you know, um, simplify the problem. You know, this danger of using conventional platitudes, oh, it's gonna get well. And the other danger is impatient protest, this kind of despair, okay, it's so bad and I give up. Having said this, you know, just to kind of, you know, bring in the discussion, I think that the Bible is brutally and unashamedly honest about, the existential condition of man. The, 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 it witnesses fully to the problem of suffering. And it's, it's very unashamed about it. And I think this, is, this means that the Bible is not just some happy tale to keep us going. It is something that engages with our own existential problem, our own struggle. And this should console us. From Job's question of, does the maker of the universe not care? To Jeremiah's you know, cry, the Lord has, has seduced me. Some translations say has deceived me. Some say he has duped me and I've allowed myself to be duped because on account of his call of Jeremiah, Jeremiah suffered when he proclaimed God's word. He was persecuted and he said, the Lord has seduced me and, and I've allowed myself to be seduced. He was crying out from the profundity of his pain. To Israel's, how can we sing the Lord's song in a, in a strange land? How? How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Foreign land becomes a metaphor for their condition of pain and suffering. To the psalmist, you know, with tears that pierce me to the heart, my enemy revive me, asking me, where is your God? Even the whole question of how long, O oh Lord? So the Bible gives full witness of pain. And even Jesus's cry of the religion, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So the Bible is honest. And unashamed about the fact that you know suffering is the facticity of our human existence. So I think that that opens up you know this whole question of why do people suffer? 
A simple Judeo-Christian answer or perspective by Judeo-Christian, I mean how Jews and Christians see it. First of all, let's be clear, suffering is a, an ecumenical, interreligious, and indeed cross-cultural and international problem, not limited to any individual or person. It's, 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 so, it's, it's a human problem. So, but the Judeo-Christian perspective is very simple. Suffering is the birthmark of a fallen humanity. We fell as a result of sin, on account of our fall, we disobeyed God's command, and this is what we inherited. So it's intergenerational from our first parent, Adam and Eve, we pass it on in it, pass it on until the coming of Christ. Even, even that we take personal responsibility for our sin. So it's, it's, it's from the birthmark of a fallen humanity. This is, the, this is the understanding of suffering from a Judeo-Christian perspective. Now, this understanding has some basic assumptions. The first assumption is that suffering is cause and effect. So walk back from effect to the cause, and the cause is supposed to be disobedient, disobedience. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, I place before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you choose this, this kind of case law encoding of this conventional theology, what we call Convenantal theology. If you obey, you'll be blessed, you prosper, you have a land. If you disobey, you are cursed, you go on exile and you lose. So, suffering from the Judeo Christian perspective is as a result of disobedience and sin. Now, if this is how they understand suffering, I think it's very, very simplistic. Because how do you now, how do you account for those who have done everything right, like Job? How do you account? for a person like Jesus, or even Israelites who inherited the, the sin of their parents for what they have not done. So I think that the Bible also gives this full picture. And the way I wish to simply, uh, or rather address this issue is by, I, I, I coined three, three terms. And those terms, they come from me dealing with parishioners, dealing with people who are suffering, paying attention to the mystery of evil and suffering. And I came out with that term. Um, it is a term that the idea is that suffering reflects our human experience and our human experience is a journey. And in this journey, we move from location, dislocation and relocation. This is the way I say it, from location, dislocation and relocation. Some people may express it differently like orientation, disorientation and, and reorientation. Now in location, this is when the sun is shining, all is good, happy clappy, Hunky dory. We are happy. Children are doing well. We have money to take care of ourselves. We can feed. Our health is robust. Everything is going on. This is a time for Job where he was going through you know, that stage of progeny, a prosperity, and health. He had seven boys, three girls. He had plenty of properties, and he had good health. This is location. We all go through this stage. Everything seems well. All is good. God is love. God is kind. Life is good. Then we now begin to break, where we break down into dislocation. And this is when Job started going through you know, his own period of dislocation. He, he, he broke down in tears. He started questioning God. Do you not care? Are you just? You're holding court on my account. I mean, look at what I'm going through. Everything we know about God fragments, breaks down. We enter into this dark night of the soul, this place of rhetorical question. Where are thou, my God? How long, oh Lord? So there's that disorientation. Conventional theology breaks down. Speechlessness, our normal rhetoric, we cannot speak anymore. We enter this stage. Then after this stage, we have the last stage, which is reorientation. And in this reorientation, we find that one receives some kind of newness, restoration. It can so happen that people go from dislocation to dislocation to dislocation. We must acknowledge that. But for the most part, it seems to follow a pattern of you know, location, dislocation, relocation. I call it orientation, disorientation, reorientation. How did Job respond to his own, this, this circle of his life? The first way Job re responded to his own location is that I think that it's an attitude of tr truth. He told himself the truth when his wife was telling him after he went through his predicament, said, curse God and die. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes, blessed be the name of the Lord. If we receive good from the Lord, why should we resist when bad things come? Job 1, 21 to 10. The first attitude response is response of truth. He told himself suffering is like intrinsically woven to our existence. 
The second response of Job is attitude of trust. In the midst of all of this, he cried out deference to, to the God. Though you slay me, I trust in thee. I know my redeemer lives. So 13 verse 15 and Job 19, if, if you read 19, you see him making the point, I know my redeemer lives. The third response of Job is that of humility. After all of this problem of disorientation, when he encountered God in the world in chapter 42, he said, I have heard about you by hearsay. I have heard about you by circumstance, but now I have encountered you, I've seen you. I think I got it all wrong. He received a new insight and new perspective after that encounter. And this was his reorientation filled with a lot of fancy words. Job's later, later days, Job's later days were blessed more than the former days. Job had double fortune, 140 years. Everything was replaced, you know, and it ended beautifully. Job died old and full of years, reorientation or re relocation. This applies to all other instances. I can give two more examples just before I conclude. The, 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 the first, another second example is that of the Israelites. In their days of orientation, you know, they, 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 they were rejoicing and celebrating. They were called God's special people. God gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. Then God gave them a land, a, a city called Jerusalem, Jerusalem, a city of peace. Then God gave them a temple where he dwelt with them on earth, heaven on earth, represented in their temple. And then God gave them a king to rule over them. It was so good before the exile. This was a period of location, it gave them victory over their enemies. It's not like in period of location, we don't have problems, but it's not as grave as the catastrophe that we go through. Then we came to the period of their dislocation. What happened? They lost everything. First, they lost that land flowing with milk and honey because they were invaded by the Babylonians. First, Assyrian attacked them, Babylonian came, destroyed the land. They lost the temple, the symbol of God's presence in their midst. They lost their king, the monarchy collapsed completely. As if that, all of this were not enough. Their special status were questioned. They started to wonder if their God had been defeated. This was their period of dislocation and disorientation. The whole idea that the theology they believed in, nothing seemed to work. And then there was reorientation. During their period of reorientation, they returned to God. They returned to grace. They returned to this same land. God gave them priests instead of kings. And they enjoyed, again, friendship with God, but a renewed friendship, not necessarily going back to former ways, but a new grace, new blessing. What about Jesus when he started his ministry? It was all good. You know, he healed, he taught, he performed miracles. Then what happened? He started to fragment. You know, they proposed him, they denied him, they persecuted him, they abandoned him. And then on the cross, he cried, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Why hast thou forsaken me? That was his own disorientation. That was his own dislocation. And then there is reorientation after he resurrected, after he ascended, and said to reestablish his church. So I think that this pattern gives me an idea that why one cannot completely understand the mystery of suffering or evil. There seems to be some kind of moral order. There seems to be some kind of pattern that life follows. And this is what I've tagged this evening, location, dislocation, relocation, or call it orientation, disorientation, reorientation. And how do people respond? For the Israelites, they responded with self-blame. We messed up, it is our fault. Then they repented, made confession of their sin. I kept it secret, I was wounded. I confessed and God healed me. And then ultimately, holy resilience. They kind of said, you know, they, they survived through their resilience. And Jesus responded with love. What I'm saying is that it is from my own point of view, this question is difficult to honestly respond to, but the way I came at it is to think about the fact that suffering is inevitable. And apart from the fact that suffering is inevitable, there seems to be a pattern in which we see that people move from you know, this location where everything seems to be going where to, sorry, from location, everything seems to be going where to this location and then to relocation. In the midst of all of this, we find this question of human suffering. And I hope that as we, as we go on to discuss, then we can, start, we, can start, we can start to think about how to, does one even respond to, to some practical, you know, tangible and concrete cases of, of, of suffering. Thank you, Father Anthony. Thank you for that. Um, 
I really enjoyed it. I was taking notes. I think you said some really noteworthy things. And um, just in the sake of time, I will move on to Father Melky. So Father Melky can take the floor. And then when we're done with all three fathers, then we'll ask questions. So Father Melky. Um, yes. Um, uh, thank you, Father Tony, for that expose. Um, also, I agree. I mean, a lot of things you said are, especially in the preamble, I think you're very spot on. This question, nobody can actually um, address it because I feel, I mean, just to give a very simple um, response, why do people suffer if God is all good? I actually think that this question is, is, is more about the goodness of God than any other thing. But how do we say God is good and he allows us to suffer. In other words, he permits evil. How do we justify God being good and the presence of evil in our world? I actually think this is, this is what this question is, is, is battling with. So um, just as Father Tony responded, I mean, um, that our very existence itself just means that we're going to endure something. But I think the deeper question is, why do we have to go through that? Why? If we have a good God, why? And the question bothers me as much as it bothers every other person here. And yes, I'm a priest, but I've also gone through rough patches and um, hard times, and, and I'm sure everybody has. So if I have a good God and I'm serving a good God and he's got my back, why do I need to go through all of this? Um, we will really never be able to answer these questions until we meet God face to face and we find out why he has done things the way he has done things. Um, other than that, we'll always we'll just be asking. And I think that's what it means when he says that uh, when we meet him, we'll see clearly. So um, while we are struggling with our not seeing clearly, we still try to make sense of life. And just when I think about, the more I think about this question, I also think about how so many reputable thinkers in the past have tried to make sense of human existence, human life. And when you go back to the very first acclaimed, you know, thinkers who at least wrote down their thoughts and showed us how they battled and how they engaged human existence, I think one of the biggest ideologies we come up with is essentialism, which basically is saying that, well, it's because the human being, there's an essence in us. You know, God has put a certain essence in us. So when we come into the world, this is the, we have a way we must live to, to follow this essence, this theology, this teleology that God has put, this reason for which God has put us into the world. But over the years, I think essentialism was basically challenged by another kind of thought. And what challenged this thought? It's this question the fact that there was so much suffering in the world, the fact that there was so much evil in the world, it made people wonder what kind of God manages this world that, that is evil. So what is the meaning of our living? What is the essence of human life if this kind of evil is in the world? And this, I mean, maybe the first person to really coin up this kind of thinking was Kierkegaard. You know, this thinking became to be known as existentialism and basically what existentialism is saying is that look as a human being you're in the world and we are thrown into this world there is no logic for why we are here you can never if there is a logic why you're here you can never find that logic and i'm saying this this is the best of human thoughts these thoughts will be made very famous by I mean, Jean-Paul Sartre, some of us have heard him, a French philosopher, and um, Friedrich Nietzsche. So they, they were responding to that there is an essence, there is a reason why we're here. Nietzsche is saying, there's no reason. It's just, we're just here, accept the way you are, whatever suffering befalls you, accept it and be ready to live your life through it. Jean-Paul Sartre, Kierkegaard, they tell us that, you see, suffering comes from our free will, suffering comes from the fact that we even find out that we are actually so free. And in our freedom, in these, in these 
sea of choices that we have, we start, we start experiencing anguish in that we don't even know what to do. Even if you know what to do, you regret it after you've done it. You know, he has, there are many of them speak in very contradictory manners, but that is to show you what, what they're pursuing. Like there's a, there's, a, there's a meaninglessness for them to life. And that meaninglessness is coming because they couldn't make sense of the suffering in the world. So you'll see that existentialism actually took off after the Second World War. And I mean, think, looking at the carnage that was that Second World War, it made people sit back and think, what God would permit this? Not once, but twice. So that even, I mean, the myth of Sisyphus is one of the myths that's usually peddled to explain. I think Albert Camus was the one who actually put that forward to explain human life. That is futile. Sisyphus was that, you know, that, that being that was punished, you know, to roll up a boulder up a, a hill and then watch it roll back down again. And then he goes back down the hill and starts rolling. So this is our life. You go th through life building and in one second, everything is destroyed. How do you explain that? How do you explain God in all of this? And here is one thing I, I, I think the lesson I came when I was looking through, I mean, I mean, when I was reading through the works of the existentialists and I was trying to connect their work to this question is the fact that the only thing they offer at the end of the day is that in human freedom, we are the ones to make our choices by ourselves. And it's these choices, of course, that bring us anguish, that bring us sorrow, that bring us anxiety, because there's so many. There's so many. We can't choose where to go. We can't be so sure about what to do. One says, if you marry, you regret it. If you don't marry, you regret it. If you marry or you don't, or you don't marry, you regret it. If you marry, you will regret it. I mean, the contradiction in choices that we make. So ultimately, what they leave us with is the fact that in human life, the meaninglessness brings us nothing but emptiness. So life ends up being nothing when you connect it only to the human person, when you relate it only to the human reason as an end, because there is no reason. We can't find a reason. We can't reconcile suffering for why we're here. So the atheists, I mean, the theist existentialists, they are the only ones who provide a reason. And that's Kierkegaard. He says, so the only reason we can find, you know, to li live meaningfully with suffering is actually Jesus Christ, is God. And he says, even at that, you cannot come to it through reason. You can only come to it by making a leap of faith. And I think for me, this is where I find my own peace too. Because in that leap of faith, what we are doing is looking also at the very life of God as man. That if he came into our own world and he would experience suffering, existing in this human condition, going through even sometimes the worst kind from his birth in a manger, in a very shitty place, to his death on the cross, then who are we? If he could also experience maybe in some sense that anguish, that angst they're talking about when he cried out on the cross, then we are also going to experience that. But even in crying out on the cross, he points us to the way in which we still find our answers. Because we know that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, was the opening verse of Psalm 22. You read that psalm, it's also a psalm of somebody experiencing the dark night of the soul, questioning where is God in my suffering? But even as he was questioning, where is God in my suffering? You read the rest of that psalm. He was also saying, he was also saying, well, I will hope in God. I will trust him still. I will still call on this God. And that's exactly what the son of God was doing. So even the answer to that so-called meaninglessness that we, 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 we um, experience when we meet with whatever challenge, whatever tragedy, whatever human suffering that befalls us, the answer is still to look to God, is still to call on God. And it's only in that way that we actually find meaning to our suffering. I mean, we can always give the um, rationalized responses such as, how would you know joy if you didn't know suffering? It's true. Suffering, in a sense, enhances your joy. Um, I was, 
I, I was following, and for those of us who are aficionados of, of um, basketball, I was following the NBA finals this, this um, last week. And the team that emerged the champions, the Golden State Warriors, it was so funny because just um, two years before, they had the worst record in the NBA. In other words, they were at the dregs, the bottom, the bottom pile of the lot. And so it made this victory, uh, according to what the players were saying, when they were asked, what made this, what's making this so sweet for you? What do you relish most about this victory? They were always making reference to the fact that just two years ago, due to injuries and, and um, one tragedy or the other, and these injuries, mark you, are kind of sufferings. Because some of those players were talking about the whole process of rehabilitation, how hard it was. One of them actually rehabilitated for a whole year only for the season to begin and he was re-injured and he had to start the process all over again. So for him to come to this point where he was now a champion, having gone through all of that, you see, it's one of what these existentialists say. You say, we live, we live life, you know, looking backwards while living forward. We, everything about life, it only makes sense to us when we look back, but we have to live it moving forward. Those choices the suffering, making the victory sweeter. So yes, there is some kind of merit we can find in suffering when we think about it in light of light and darkness. How would you, it just con construct, contrasting um, um, differences. How would you know this if you do not have that? How would you know joy if you did not have pain? I mean, these are just one of the ration, rationalizations we can offer, but ultimately, ultimately the answer to human suffering is to be found in Christ, who also as man, God as man, suffered. And if we are saying that we are Christians and we have faith in him and we believe in him as a father who would never cause his children a needless tear, then that is where we'll find our solace. That is where we'll find our peace. I mean, the truth is Jesus himself did not embrace the suffering easily. We know how we're told he, he called his disciples, he said, stay with me. Stay with me. He was scared. That's a human being. When you're going through pain, you want people with you. You want someone who can, who can ride the storm with you. And he called them, stay with me. And what did they do? They slept off. And we're told he, he wept, he cried. Father, if, if, if we can do this some other way, but not your will, not my will, but yours be done. Surrendering again to God from that moment till the very end where he was crying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So my interest, um, I mean, with this um, insight I'm putting out here is to listen to also maybe the questions that will come subsequently to guide, you know, what, what direction our, this, this discourse will take. But this is the insight I, I think I could provide. And I'm just thinking that from our best minds of human minds, left to human reason alone, the only thing they had to offer us is life is, becomes nothingness if we leave it at the level of human reasoning, if we try to understand human suffering at the level of human reasoning. I mean, if you even think about some of the books they wrote, the titles they wrote. So Kierkegaard, some of his works was Sickness Unto Death. The sickness of finding that you're so free with the choices you have. Um, uh, Heidegger wrote Being and Time. Sartre wrote Being and Nothingness. In other words, your life, your being actually ends in nothingness because all of it is, is, is nothing. You're wasting, I mean, you make all these choices and everything scatters. We, we decide what we want to be, we be whatever we want to be, but at the end of it, it comes to north with death. And maybe a powerful response by way of titles again, would be um, Sarah's book, God or Nothing. So while an existentialist who does not believe in God is saying, well, because there's human suffering, look, do whatever you want to do. Life is coming to nothing at the end of the day, being a nothingness. A believer, Sarah, would write, it's either God or what, or nothing. So if you do not have God, then you will end up in nothingness. You will end up with nothing. So it is God that gives us the answer. It is God that makes us something. It is God that makes our life meaningful because he was the author in the first place. So I, I think I'd, I'd leave my, my submissions here and wait for other questions to guide our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Melky. That was very, very, very insightful and definitely a different perspective. So we're gonna open the floor now to Father Emmanuel. So 
you have the floor to share your wisdom. Thank you, Blondie. Thank you so much. Um, Father Tony has done an excellent work as a biblical scholar, taking up through the scriptures. Father Melke has done a brilliant work as a philosopher. I'm wondering where to speak from now because I'm neither a biblical scholar nor a philosopher. I will find my position somewhere in the middle of both of them. But I mean, it's 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 such an, a very interesting. But the Tony started by acknowledging that this is a very humbling conversation. It requires a lot of humility to, to address this kind of question. And Father Melky has also spoken about, um, yeah, the fact that you need you need a sense of compassion. You need a sense of empathy for you to even to begin to approach these questions. I will I will. So I have gone back recently to read some of the speeches that Pope John Paul II gave, particularly because he was someone who, who had a very personal experience of suffering, and we could see it in the way that he lived his life. Not just the experience that he had of communism in Eastern Europe, in Poland, but also his own personal suffering of, of having to, to be a priest under the most terrible circumstances, of having to lead his people during atheistic communism, where the state proclaimed that there was no God and that. Um, State, the state actually replaced God, but also his own personal experience of suffering, Parkinson's disease, he was shot in 1981, and he's written quite a, a number of things about suffering. So when he visited Nigeria for the first time in 1982, he went to St. Charles Borromeo Hospital in Onicha. And I've gone back recently to his speech, the speech that he gave to the sick people in that hospital who were suffering. And this was what Pope John Paul II said in his speech. He says, as long as we are on our earthly pilgrimage, Suffering and sickness still exist, will exist. They are part of our human condition, and ultimately, they are the result of original sin. That's an explanation. So why is there suffering in the world? This is a simple explanation. This is the result of original sin. This was not God's original intention for us. So this is a deviation. This is some sort of disorientation, to use um, the term of other Anthony. But they are not necessarily the fault of the individual. There are many people of different ages who suffer through no fault of their own. So that, that raises the question of you know, this a good God in the midst of suffering that people have no really not brought upon themselves. Because children in particular are vulnerable to suffering. So a child is born, a child is born with cancer or with some form of deformity, and you're asking. So what has this innocent little baby done to deserve this kind of suffering? often caused by the thoughtlessness or negligence of adults. So there are sufferings that people undergo, children undergo suffering as a result of uncaring parents, parents who simply do not care. A mother is playing with her phone and then this child falls into the swimming pool or the child crosses the road and is crushed by a car. That's thoughtlessness, carelessness of parents that sometimes inflicts suffering on their children. But it says the reality of sickness and malnutrition in the lives of millions of children is also a fact that calls for attention and action. So. Look at children in war-torn situations. Thousands of malnourished, hungry, starving children with sure cough. And you're asking, so like, what, what is this? How do you explain all of this? And the condition of the retarded child makes us think about the very meaning of human life. So the child is born and the child is expected to grow and develop. No, the child is not growing and developing. The child is actually retarded. Old age too brings its own particular difficulties and physical weakness. But the point that strikes me very much in what Pope John Paul II was saying is, he says, although God allows suffering to exist in the world, he does not enjoy it. I love that line. God allows suffering to, to exist in the world, but God does not enjoy suffering. So this is not, this is not a masochistic God, a God who derives pleasure from seeing people suffer. So he sits down there, he's aloof, he doesn't care about what people are going through, and then he seems to derive some form of pleasure to see that people are crying and weeping and mourning. No, so John Paul says, God does not enjoy suffering. Indeed, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, made man, loved the sick, he devoted a great part of his earthly ministry to healing the sick and comforting the afflicted. Our God is a God of compassion and consolation. So, that's the part of the speech that Pope John Paul II gave uh, to me that I want to. So he said, ends by saying, our God is a God of compassion. So when, when, when the question is asked, where is God when people suffer? Or 
how can we explain that God is good and yet people suffer? The question often presumes as if God is sitting in one place and then all those who are suffering are suffering in another direction. So there's this dissociation that takes place between a good God and a suffering people or a suffering person. But the point is that God is there in the gallows. So like the experience of Jesus who suffers, I mean, the point, what, what does compassion mean? Compassion means so, to suffer with. So if we say our God is a God of compassion, we are saying that our God is not a God who sits, who is indifferent to suffering, who sits somewhere else and is watching other people who are suffering. No, where people are suffering is where you find God. So where is God when people are suffering? God is there in the midst of the suffering. So I think that the framing of the question to, so when people are saying, where is God when I'm suffering? Like God is there, God is there. He is where you are. So like the unshakable faith that the psalmist confessed in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are here with me. Like he is there. The challenge is whether we see him or whether we feel his presence. So it's whether people really feel that God's presence is here in the midst of suffering. I make make made the reference to the Second World War, the Holocaust, and how that generated this whole question of suffering, understanding suffering in the world, the approach that philosophers have taken and the approach that people of faith have taken. One book that has fascinated me so much, I mean, when people are suffering, you don't tell them to go and be reading books. Maybe we who read the books will have to have some way of having to explain to them, but if people can read, even in the midst of suffering, I mean, that's brilliant. So this book is written by Ellie Weisel, who is a Jewish Holocaust survivor. He, after the, after the um, Second World War, and then his eventual release, he came to America and he became a professor in a university. He's, he wrote, he became, he also won the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1986, I think, yeah. He has a book titled Night. The title of the book is just Night. But it shows the mystery of evil. So suffering, evil, I mean, it's a mystery. We cannot simply unravel everything in this life. But America Father Tony have pointed to the fact that you can only resolve this in eschatological way. It is only in the finality of being in the presence of God that can all of the problems that we are having. So all that we do in this world is to try to grapple with it, to try to understand, to make sense of, of suffering. Eliwaze writes this book, Night, but the book is actually about how much evil can take place in one night. How much evil can take place in one night from um, conscripting Jews in different parts of Europe, rounding them up, putting them in the train and sending them to different concentration camps where they are sent to the gas chambers or they're executed in, I mean, in terrible forms. It shows how much evil can happen in, in one night. But there's, there's this conversation that takes place in the book. So there's this SS guard who hangs a little child, hangs a little child on a stick. And every other person is helpless, having to watch this little child die. And then from within the crowd, there's a question that was raised by a man. Where is God? Where is God that this child is being hung on a stick? This little child, where is God? And Eliwazo says, the answer is that God is there. God is also hanging on a stick with that little child. Where is God when that happens? So, but it, I mean, it's it's made me realize how much how much down through history people have grappled with this question, and that's why one of the one of the the one up Christian approach to suffering is not even to this is silence. So John Paul II visited a number of concentration camps. You go back and read his speeches. He always begins from a point of before this terrible evil, before the suffering that humanity has undergone during the Second World War, the Holocaust. The first answer that Christian theology has to offer is to be quiet, is silence. Silence before the mystery of evil. Like, what, what is there to say? What do you want to say looking at how much evil the human heart, human ingenuity can conceive? Silence before the mystery of evil. Go back and read the speeches of Pope Benedict XVI, who's visited also a number of concentration camps. And I mean, his situation was even worse than this was something that was perpetrated by his own country. He says, I come here as a pope of the Catholic Church, but I'm a German. And so that puts me in a very awkward situation because this was something carried out by Hitler and the German Nazi party. 
But he says, what's the first answer? Silence. Silence before the mystery of evil. There's not much that we have to say. Now, there's this movie that was released, um, not, not, I, I mean, it's a bit recent, but it's about Pope Francis, a man of his words. And this was, I mean, it's a very brilliant movie. So this was Pope Francis visiting the Philippines in 2015 after this typhoon, um, Ayan, that killed 7,000 people displaced 4 million people from their homes and caused 6 million workers to lose their sources of income. So when Pope Francis arrived in this city of Pakloban, they told that he went to speak to the people and he spoke to them from his heart, as Pope Francis often does. And this is what he says to them. So many of you have lost everything. I don't know what to say to you only to keep silence and to accompany you in my heart silently. We are not alone. We have Jesus, our elder brother. And we also have many brothers who at the moment of the catastrophe came to our assistance. Forgive me if I have no other words, but with the strength that Jesus gives us, our elder brother, let us move forward. He says, forgive me if I have no other words. The only thing I have to offer you is my silence before suffering, terrible suffering that you have, have undergone. Now, this is a, a very important question for theology. So, like, I mean, look back at the experience of Nigeria over the last few years. Last week or the week before the experience in Owo, the massacre of Christians who had gone to church to worship on Pentecost Sunday. Think about the bomb blast in Madala in 2013, 2012. Think about different places where people have been killed and it doesn't have to be Christians alone, wherever human beings are killed. And you ask the question, what does, what does Christian faith have to offer? What does Christian theology have to say to all of these things? Two weeks ago, there was this experience, I mean, of a group of people somewhere in Owa. I don't know if this was really true, but I mean, it was said that they had to go to consult the, the local deities. And then uh, the phrase went to post to say, well, you see, uh, Bros. J could not answer their question. How can people go to church on a Sunday and then they are killed? But they call on the name of the Lord. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But these people are calling on the name of the Lord in the heart of worship and they are killed. And he says, well, you see, Bros. J cannot answer their question. And that is why they have decided to go to consult a local date, the native date. And you know, it speaks to the reality of our own situation, what, if, what, what some scholars have called a double allegiance. So there's somebody who says, I am a Christian, I worship God. But then when you are faced with these contradictions and this crisis of existence, you ask yourself, so where is God? It's like, this God doesn't seem to answer me. What do you do? Double allegiance. You look for a local deity that can answer you. My teacher, Professor Colinus Sadozo here, tells me that in evil cosmology, evil religious cosmology, there's the idea that, okay, I'm worshiping this local deity, this God. But if the God does not answer my question, if the God does not satisfy my problem, what do I do? I bundle this God and throw this God into the fire, and then I go and do what? I look for another God that can answer me. So it is, this is the existential struggle. People are asking for questions today and looking for answers to their questions. So if the Christian God does not answer my question, doesn't explain why all of this has to happen to me, then I probably will have to change my God, look for another God that can satisfy. So for me, this, 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 this raises the question of what's the relevance of Christianity and what's the relevance of Christian theology to the suffering that people undergo. So I think that on the one hand, Christian theology needs to come up with an answer. And there are several answers that people have given down through history, especially in the confrontation with the mystery of evil, particularly within the last century. I think of, 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 of German thinkers like J. John, John Baptist Metz, J.B. Metz, who um, has who has who has said that I mean at a certain point in his life he discovered that this was a brilliant theologian. He says he discovered that Christian theology has been silent about what happened at Auschwitz, the horrors of the Second World War, the Jewish Holocaust. He says, why does our theology not say anything about that? And we can go back to Nigeria and ask, why is it that our own? I mean, look at the number of theologians we have in our country. Why is it that it is difficult to find a theological response to the atrocities that, 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 that are happening to us? 
Why is it that we have not, like when people are suffering, theology doesn't, it doesn't seem to be like the first point of call for anybody. And that raises the question of relevance. I have a teacher who asks, who tells, who, who says to me, you know, if, if you hear today that the, faculty, the, the library of a law faculty in Unilag was burnt down, was raised down by fire, and you hear at the same time that the faculty of theology library at Veritas University was raised down by fire, what do you think will make public news? Theology faculty, oh, books about God. Okay, that doesn't concern people too much. If you hear that the library of a medicine, medicine faculty has been raised by fire, that makes public news. Law fact, because these are disciplines that people think are relevant to their concerns. Medicine, law, engineering, and you'll find people almost immediately who are ready to do what? Set up a new life, build a new life. But if you hear that this happened to the theology library, for people will really be concerned. So it raises the question about what's the relevance of Christian faith? What's the relevance of Christian theology to all of the questions that people are asking about human suffering? I will conclude by, so this is, I mean, trying to understand this, I have to read a number of books. I will, I will conclude by um, citing another book written by another Holocaust survivor, a Hungarian Jew, Victor Frankl. He has a book titled Man's Search for Meaning. Man's Search for Meaning. And this is his own search for meaning because he went to the concentration camp in Auschwitz, Bikenau, he saw how people suffered. And then in this book, he's trying to make sense of what is it that keeps people going, even in the midst of suffering. And he says, see, in this concentration camp, I saw people who were not willing to leave for the next moment because like there was a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. There's no reason to leave because you can see that every day you are seeing a number of people being sent to the gas chamber. You are looking up, the smoke that is going up is the smoke of human beings who are being incinerated in the gas chamber. The following day, a group of people are sent to the gas chambers. Like, so what is there to hope for? What is there to look for? So many people even died before they were sent to the gas chamber because there was no reason. And then he, he, he asked this question. So those who lived through this, this, this mystery of evil, who were able to survive, they were eventually released at the end of the world war. And like he says, what, what, made, what, what was the reason for their own survival? survival? How, do you ex, how do you explain why they survived and why others couldn't survive? He goes back interestingly to quote a philosopher that one would like that's the least person you would think about in this kind of question. This is Frederick Nietzsche that he quotes. And what does Frederick Nietzsche say? He who has a reason to live can bear with almost anyhow. That it is not suffering that, that, that people are protesting against. It is suffering without meaning. So <laughs> where people cannot find meaning in suffering, that is where it is a problem. And that, that, that's where Christianity comes in. The value of redemptive suffering that even from the experience of Jesus, we begin to see that suffering has been transformed from within. It is no longer something that leads to death. It is the pathway to life. So it is, it, it is a search for meaning that when we find meaning, when we find meaning in suffering, we can have a reason to live. He who has a reason to live can bear with almost any harm. Okay. And Frankl says that the last thing that any human being should lose is hope that hope that tomorrow can, will be better than today, that if you lose that hope, then you lose everything. There's no longer any urge to go forward, no longer the urge to live to see the next day. And he says, one of the things that kept many people was that, he says, think about one thing, one most important thing you want to accomplish in your life or something that is of great value to you. And he says, that's perhaps the reason why many people live. So there are many people who look forward to being reunited with their family. That was something that kept them going. There are certain people who had great ideas, things that they wanted to achieve in life. Those were the things that kept them going. Look at somebody like um, Ben Macmillan Colby, who had to save a man who thought about his family at the point where he was being chosen for execution. The man cried. What was his, what was his anguish about? I have a family, my wife, my children. That's a reason to live. Macmillan Kobe had to take the place of that man. He was executed while that man was eventually released. So from that man, we can see that that's true. That if people have something, oh, a wife, a child, family to go back to, some a high ideal that I think I want to achieve, something that I want to commit my life to. Those are the things that can keep people going even in the midst of suffering. But these are just scattered thoughts that I am offering, but that's 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 it.
for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Emmanuel. Um, I really like that we've literally gotten three different perspectives. And I think it's very good to be able to listen or understand the basis of suffering from three different sides. So I'm going to open up the floor to questions now. And I have some questions. I'm going to read out the first one. And this is um, this is very personal. So it's in regard to children. And it says, uh, why are children born to suffer? I was born with a birth defect and I'm still suffering from it till today. In fact, the illness has given birth to several others to add to what I'm already dealing with. It's not fair. I didn't do anything wrong. Why was I born this way? I'm just tired. Um, I carry on like I'm strong and nothing bothers me, but I'm really tired and I'm really bothered. And um, another question, I'm going to lump these two together, is why are my innocent grandchildren, my granddaughter is 11 and my grandson who is 12, they were both born autistic. How do I explain this? So in a situation where, you know, the suffering or the pain has to deal with children, um, how do we reconcile this with God being good? And this is open to any of the priests can actually answer. So you have the floor. But let me have a go. Um... I think Augustine says, seek or comprehend this non est Deus. If we understand him, then he ceases to be God. And that's why I kept emphasizing from the beginning that we need this elevated perspective from personal encounter. It will not neutralize the pain and predicament, but it's going to give us a different perspective of how to see that condition. A friend I know who has children with special needs. And I asked her, how do, you, how do you take care of these children? How does it make you feel? And she said to me that she thinks that God goes around looking for who can take care of these children for him. This is her perspective. This is somebody who has done it for years. And this is coming from a place of personal experience. And maybe God feels like, you know, she's able to, 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 to take care of these children, finding meaning in loving them. And so that kind of gave me a perspective. Once there is, like Jeffo quoting Nietzsche, saying that once there is a why to live, then you can deal with it anyhow, the reason to live. To specific question of children, this is what I, I, I will answer with a story that I read about this pastor who went to Africa to serve them with his wife and they gave their whole life, everything they had. And after serving for over 25 years, they tried to return back to the States. And as they got back there, they've lost everything. They saw people who were corrupt, who were, who were, who were, who lived, you know, who were stealing money, how they were being celebrated. And nobody even noticed them, despite the fact that they gave all their life to serve God. And this was when they returned home to their home country in America. And he was so depressed that he looked at his wife. He said, is this, is this all we got after doing the work of God? And the wife looked at him and said, but we're not yet home. We're not yet home. This world is not our home. We are wayfarers. We're not yet home. I, I think that with these children, I would say to this person, you're not, you're not yet home. And I believe that when we are home, you, you would see that God will give you, you know, he will not only renew you, he will give you abundance of blessing. So maybe what I should ask is that how do you now respond to this, your situation? What do you do with the anger? What do you do with the pain? What do you do with the anxiety that you feel on account of your situation? Maybe, you know, you feel like someone should be held accountable. There, there, are, there, are, there are four things we can do with the way we feel about suffering or anger. First, you can decide to, to act it out, in which case I don't believe in God, there is no God, I will live carelessly, I'm not gonna care about anything moral, I will just anarchy. That's one way, this is acting out our frustration. Another way is to live in denial and pretend that it's not there, so you live in denial, but it's there and it's eating you up and it will look for outlets it will look for outlet to manifest itself. Either you transfer aggression or, or you take it out on your family or you take it out on your friends or you take it out on the institution or you take it out on the church or you take it out 
on Christianity or you take it out on your family members or your siblings. I think that if the first thing is that if you don't act it out and you live in denial and suppress it, there's going to be a danger that's going to come out in another way. Then the other thing you can do is to, is to offer it up and give it to God. Give God that feeling. He, like OJ, the man for the money was saying, he's not unfeeling, he's not an absentee landlord. He's not a deus absconditus. He, he feels with you. So give it to him, tell him how you feel and be honest, like Job, be honest, have, have a conversation with him, tell him how you feel and alternatively find meaning in that suffering. I'm sure when you look inwards, you will find some meaning even in the midst of this prevailing debilitating circumstance of pain and anguish. Thank you, Father. Just to quickly chip in to what Father has said, um, the passage he started with um, at some point, you remember when Jesus was asked who sinned, this man or his parents? And I'm sure that this, this um, young lady is probably thinking the same thing. What did I do? I didn't do anything wrong. Um, and Jesus replied, neither sinned. In other words, the sickness was not as a result of the man's sins, nor his parents. He said, but it was for the glory of God. And he went on to demonstrate that glory of God. And this is where I always say like our faith comes in because if we look at it from the point of reason alone, we, become, we will only arrive at a reasonable, no, we would actually arrive at no reason, you understand? So we would, we would come to that point of angst, you know, that, that point of futility, you know, and Gosia, that's the word they use, you know, futility, life is futile. So for the glory of God, and God demonstrated his glory through a sick person for everyone. Um, Cardinal Sarah, when he was interviewed, um, he was asked what was his inspiration for one of his most beautiful books, The Power of Silence. And he was, he, he mentioned a certain brother Vincent, you know, who was, in, um, who was um, suffering from multiple sclerosis. And he said, this brother could not move, could not speak. And yet, in his motionlessness, in his lack of speech, in that, in that you know, crippled condition, Sarah could communicate with somebody who, who he believed was contemplating God, even while in that position. And that was, if you read that book, you will see how deep and profound that book is, The Power of Silence. That was the inspiration for that book that has changed the lives of so many others, a sick person. Um, when we talk about the glory of God, it means even when somebody is down, he can be the inspiration to others to be up. Um, the, the simple example, uh, some, I don't know if some years back or a year ago, we're looking at that image of that boy who, was, who just came to Lagos and was selling water, you remember? He was down on his luck. He was, he was just selling pure water. He had nothing. But then he looks out and he sees people in, in a prison van begging for money and what does he do he starts distributing what he has because he saw people he was better than you know so and this is why you know people fight and it's we the church is very insistent on the rights of even people who are sick or handicapped or 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 deformed in any way that they are human beings and their integrity must be protected because they are still there they are still alive for the glory of god and i think in the end that's what father twin was talking about to this person, find meaning to your life. There is a glory that God also wants to share to the world through you. Never let that go. What Viktor Frankl, which um, Father Jaipur shared about, he, talk, he talked about logos therapy. You know, finding that meaning. That meaning is there in your life. And you don't know who you're even speaking to, even just by sharing, you know, your pain and your suffering. So never forget you are here for the glory of God. And that glory is in all of us all of us, as long as we are here. So Father, um, Father Melky, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, and I want to put a face to suffering. I know a lot of us, when we look at people who are really strong in their faith, and then we kind of think maybe, you know, they haven't really gone through things. Um, can you share a personal experience of, and very briefly, personal experience when you went through intense suffering, how did you stand? What was your reaction? What was your impression of God at the time? Were you angry with God? And how did you overcome that? 
and just very briefly just for the sake of time yeah if i should i mean just off the top of my head a very personal experience was the loss of my dad and i know that um death is something that's very personal it, it touches all of us differently it touches everyone certainly differently and of course um i i think he died quite young he was 64 so I just felt he had more to to live and he wasn't very sick. So I think that that was a moment in my life that I felt touched profoundly. And honestly, that death, when I was re eventually, when I would even come in contact with the, you see, it's just like they say, you, you live life, or you understand life backwards. You know what this existentialist was saying? It came to me, all those thoughts that we had read, it came to me like, what is the meaning of this life? Here he was one day, gone the next day. You know, you looked outside, the sun was still shining. People were still going to work. People were going about their business like nothing happened. You felt like screaming out to the whole world. Don't you know my dad is dead? All of you should like stop, you know? So you feel that, you feel that pain too. And then you look at it like, okay, so what's all this for? Everything I'm struggling for day to day, waking up, going to work, going to read, going to classes, going for lectures. What is it for? If at the end of the day, I'm just going to drop and end up like this, you know, as I sat reflecting before his, his body. So these are all the stages of suffering, human suffering that one must go through. But even as I'm going through those stages, I still know that what will bring meaning to all of that again is the same God. The same God that you are questioning because you only have to reflect on his own life too. So there is no hypocrisy there that he went through the same and he died even younger, even in a worse state too. So that there's no kind of shape or form of death that will come to any of us that will say it was so terrible because Christ went through the worst and he's the one asking us to follow him. So for me, there is ultimate meaning in you know, looking up to Christ, looking to the example of God himself I mean, if he put us in this world and he has set it to work, he has told us, okay, this is the way you must go. And he came and he walked that talk. So who are we? So of course, I, for me, very quickly, that is exactly what brought me back to heal. And that is what brought me, you know, I mean, away from all those questions, which I said is natural and it's normal for everybody to go through those stages. But in the end, we would find, we would find that meaning in God again, to understand even the life that he promises us is not one that's here. And he has said it over and over again, the reason he died and rose. So the life he promised us is not here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So very briefly for three to five minutes, I'm going to bring up Father Paulinus Odozo, who is a Holy Ghost priest and a professor of moral theology at the University of Notre Dame. So Father, if you can unmute yourself and just in the interest of time, can we please keep it under five minutes, please? Thank you. Father Polinos, are you here? I'm trying to unmute myself. Okay, perfect, we can hear you. You can hear me and sorry, I crashed. Your program. <laughs> Father, Father Emmanuel forced me, and I was just sitting in my little study doing stuff, and he came and said I must listen to this, and I'm glad I'm hearing what you very brilliant minds are saying about this. But just quickly, let me just point out to you what you must know, that, and the, our brilliant speakers have made a lot of distinctions that are important. You must distinguish between Sufferings we bring about as, as a result of the abuse of our, uh, our free will. It was not God who killed those people on that train from Kaduna to Abuja. It was not God who willed that uh, people in Nigeria should not find food. God has given us all the power and the freedom to use uh, our knowledge and things to get ourselves well. And so there are things we cannot uh, uh, blame on God in any way. We must be very careful. Uh, and God cannot take, take responsibility for what we as human beings can do. And there is so much that we are doing that we can. But having said all of that, there is still that senseless, suffering 
un, very not understandable to us as human beings. And you can go back to the book of Job. We didn't <laughs> start this question. Uh, the, the book of Job and uh, all the minds here have spoken about that. People have always asked why, why, uh, 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 what is happening and so on. But what I want to focus on are two or three things. As a Christian community, I think the question is no longer why, because there's still the element, uh, Father uh, Tony and uh, Zedek and uh, Uja, uh, Emmanuel have talked about. But the Christian community says, okay, we don't understand everything. And when we meet God, <laughs> God will answer. But meanwhile, we must be careful. What is the Christian attitude to, uh, resi uh, to suffering? First of all, it must be an attitude of resistance. Christians are called with Christ to resist evil and suffering wherever they are. Christians must get together. Okay, so there's so much hunger, there's so much pain, there's so much uh, violence. The, one of the first things Christians have, one thing Christians have done is to do everything to, re, to push back the frontiers of this evil. We have established hospitals, we have established clinics, we have established schools, we have, we have tried to talk about good governance and so on. And Christians cannot stop doing that. There must be, we must not say, oh, we don't know any much about this. Christian resistance. And that resistance is built on love and solidarity. Father, you was asked, talking about his own experience uh, in a suffering, uh, 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 situations of suffering. In my nearly 40 years as a priest, the greatest answer I have found to suffering is Christian solidarity and love. To the question of suffering. When, when things happen, Christians get together and work uh, and work to and, uh, and and work very in solidarity to see what they can do in love. You are talking about your mother, your father. I talked about my mother, who died, who was dying when I was in the seminary of cancer, painful cancer, very faithful woman. She was dying, and as I was reading Nietzsche, you guys were talking about Nietzsche. I wrote my philosophy dissertation on Nietzsche, and he was convincing me that God didn't exist. Especially when I remember that my mother was at home suffering, I said, oh, this guy is correct. Do you know? And, and I wanted them to sell, expel me from the seminary at the time because I, we went to pray and I didn't see what, what these guys were talking about and praying all that. What was, what was this all about? And hey, those of you who are here would know what it means. I was a sacristan <laughs> at that time. I would simply wake up in the morning and go and prepare the mass, places for mass and run back to my room. Do you know what saved me? The love and solidarity of my community. And when I, they, they, my friends would come out and drag me out of my room and say, let's go to church and pray. I would sit down there and would sit to one end and looking at them, are these people serious? When I remember that my mother at home was suffering, was praying and God, where is this God? Why can't he come and even put some little solace into her? But the way, the way they showed me love, the way they understood, gave me room and understood what was happening to me, that thing carried me into the ministry. I realized two things. One, I cannot, or I don't always have the answers to the human suffering, and I must not pretend I do have all the answers, no matter what, sometimes you pray and prayer fails you. But secondly, I realized that I was not totally bereft of, of solidarity. So as a young priest, those of you, I was, sorry, I was, I can name, I was at Ihala as a young priest. At that time, Ihala is now 13, 13 parishes. There were two of us running the place. But I enjoyed going to everywhere, you know, hanging out, especially whenever people were in need, in need or suffering, my heart went out because I had been through that myself. So, um, I mean, there's so, so much we can do and say, to, my thing is not to waste my time anymore, asking why. When we, I meet God, I will ask him, uh, why? Why did, he, why, was, why did he not even spare his son 
the death on the cross. Why? There are a lot of people who brought out their own stories here today that are really interesting and very, very typically hard and very serious. Some of the people are asking, why me? I don't know. I, I, can, I don't always pretend I know. But my faith tells me that the ground on which I stand is strong. That ground provided by Jesus Christ gives me the cause not only to hope, but also to engage in actions of solidarity and at, at, for, with those who are suffering and in actions of, of, of uh, 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 you know, revolt, so to speak, uh, uh, against suffering in whatever way I can. Whenever I see people suffering or do whatever I can with my community as a Christian, with my people, I will do something to resist evil. But I, I don't waste my, maybe I'm getting too old, but I don't waste my time anymore. I don't get waste my time anymore. Uh, uh, Thank you very uh, much, Father. Um, asking, so uh, uh, let me just stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you actually answered a couple of questions that we had. Um, so thank you for that. That was very, very helpful and very insightful. So I have another question from the audience. Is suffering the punishment for sin? And if so, why is it that those who stole or steal billions of public funds don't suffer and they seem to go on and have, you know, fantastic lives at the expense of the people they're stealing from? And I think this is specifically in context to the Nigerian system and politics and bad governance. So who would like to take that question? Maybe I should just make an attempt to say something. So, um, Father Paulinus made a very important um, contribution about the fact that God has given us wisdom. He has given us knowledge. He has given us understanding. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't, um, how did St. Augustine say, it says, pray, pray as if everything depended on God. And then walk as if everything depended on you. Yeah. So God has given us wisdom to do, to, to, to transform society, to change things, to do things, to make things better. And if you have politicians who are stealing public funds that could be used for the development of the people, for the common good, this is a question of, as Father Paulino says, of suffering that is to be resisted. So this is not suffering that should be embraced with resignation. One of the challenges of life in Nigeria is that we have, as Eddie Rowe wrote in, a, in, a, in an article he published in this day newspaper many years ago, he calls um, making religion a lamppost in Nigeria. He says that there's this sense of apathy and indifference and resignation. So when things happen, people are saying, oh, God will help us. That's how Nigerians conclude every important development question, every important governance question. God will help us. And I'm saying, God is not going to come down from anywhere to help you. I tell people even when I preach in church, I say, you can do all of the crusades you want to do. Do all of the vigils you want to do. Do all of the, I mean, on the mountain, in the valley. Go up the mountain, go to the valley on the land, in the sea, whatever you want to do, do. If we don't change our attitude, nothing is going to happen. There's so much excitement about Peter Obi today. I hold my, I, I am excited too, but I hold my excitement with a pinch of salt because I realize that you can have the best president if the people of the country are not willing to change, if there's no interior moral reorientation, no transformation in the minds of the people, nothing is going to happen. Buhari came within one week and two weeks. People say, oh, it's like things are changing because it seems that everybody was going to work at 7 a.m. When they saw that, I mean, there was really nothing about this man. What happened? People went back to what they used to do. They, we saw that, oh, there were, we have power supply steadily for life. And people are saying, ah, even Buhari's attitude, body language can even up the megawatt of electricity. When they saw that nothing was happening, what happened? Everything went back. Has, it, has everything not collapsed now? So the question is, you can have a Peter or be as president if we are not willing to do our part as individuals. So, I mean, if there's one thing that I see give to APC, I, I missed all of their all of these stupid things that they have done. It is just the fact that they can come up with the idea that change begins with me. That idea of change begins with me is the only credit that I can give to that. God. That indeed, we will have to be the ones to build the kind of country that we want. That we want. I agree. So, Thank yeah. Thank you, Father. So um, we just have time for one last question. So I'm going to ask this one. Is trusting God and having faith an excuse 
or a coping mechanism for dealing with failures both within and outside our control and just like you said you know the nigerian thing is god will provide or god save us so is trusting god and having faith just an excuse or um how do we marry our faith and works with trusting god and going through the suffering okay um i think that trust is not um it's not a coping mechanism because trust is not just a protective psychological construct it's it's it requires courage it's a risk to trust and it requires courage to trust i think that trust is like you know when you trust human beings you you need to know them before you trust them but with god you you, you first of all start serving god you love him then in the process you begin to know him better so i think that trust is an act of will yes it's it's a supernatural gift in a way i i, I see it almost like uh, as, as a synonym for hope. You know, St. Paul will say that our suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, character produces um, hope, and hope does not deceive. I think that when we trust God, it's like putting our eggs in one basket and allowing God to carry it. It is, it is vouchsafe. I, I don't think that trust is just a coping mechanism. It could, along the line, very well provide us a means of coping with our debilitating circumstance and pain and anguish, but ultimately it requires an act of free to be able to trust someone you know you have not fully encountered and say, I think that I can trust you. There is a definition of hope that Obama gave sometime ago. I think he took it from the Bible. And like he said, hope is not blind optimism. Hope is not ignoring the enormity of the task uh, that is ahead or the roadblock on our path. Hope is not sitting by the sideline and doing nothing or shaking from our responsibility. It is that, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, it is that thing internally within us, that interior metal, that interior grace within us that resists capitulation, resists surrender, saying that despite everything I'm going through, something great awaits me in the future. You could see that kind of trust and hope in Habakkuk. Let me just read it briefly. It says, Habakkuk had this question of, can I trust God? You know, is this just, can I trust God? And he says, even though the fig tree does not blossom, nor fruit grow on the vine, even though the olive crop fail and field produce no harvest, even though flocks vanish from the fold and stores stand empty of cattle, I will still trust in the Lord. In summary, prayer of serenity kind of captures this whole point of trust when he says, you know, give me the serenity to accept what I cannot change. The courage, this is where trust comes in, to change what I can, and the wisdom to know what I can change and what I cannot change. So I will not see trust in this as a copy mechanism from a, from a Judeo-Christian, if you like, spiritual perspective. Hmm. Well, thank you for that, for attending. Just very quickly, I mean, um, I think it's an existential reality itself, because if we want to be honest, in business trans transactions, what, what's, what's to say that the person you're transacting the business with is not going to defraud you? I mean, we trust. You give your a simple thing like a watch to a watch repair. What, what, how do you know he's not going to remove something nice? Or you take your car to the mechanic. How are you sure he's not going to strip your car of original parts and put in fake parts that will work for some time? But I mean... You know, so we trust every day on a daily basis. And these are people we don't know. We trust that if I give him this money, he will do the right thing, even though I can't verify. So I think it's an existential reality of, for us even to trust in that higher power in God, even as we're working to, you know, to, to surmount our challenges and so on. Um, I mean, trusting is, in God is even more security, if I may put it that way, than the risk we have in trusting one another. I mean, just off the call. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I think this was a very, very enlightening, very interesting session. It's the first of many to come. Um, Isyama, do you want to take yourself off mute and kind of just close out for us, please? Okay. So good evening, everyone, and thank you again for, thank you, fathers, for such a great session. Um, just wanted, if everyone could uh, open on their on their phones or their computers, however it is you're joining, 
the website is www.menti.com um this is the first like uh, blondie said uh, session in a series of sessions um and if you could then enter in the code on that page of 5732 6503 um and what we basically want to hear from you is future topics that you would like this you know esteemed panel of priests to discuss um as well as get feedback from you for this current this first session that we've had can you um repeat the code again okay so the code again is five seven three two six five zero three so we would just like to get your feedback as to what sorts of topics you want the panel to discuss. The next session, this is this, uh, so Faith uh, in Public Square is an initiative um, and it's basically going to be held once a month. Uh, the priests in residence <laughs> for the Faith in Public Square are Father Emmanuel, Father Tony, and Father Melchizedek, but we will probably have guests uh, speakers, whether they're from the laity or whether they are actually um, from the clergy as well, joining us covering the different topics. Our next session is going to be on the 17th of July at 4.30 p.m. Um, we do start on time, so please uh, put the dates in your calendar. We will send out the flyers and the promotional in, and information through relevant networks and uh, WhatsApp groups. Um, and eventually we'll see how we can you know, pull this together. So we kind of have a community where we can all follow each other and continue the conversation. I have seen the comments in the chat box about wanting the recording afterwards. Um, we are keen to basically allow um, this message be heard several times so we did record the session we would probably we'll, we'll be looking to upload it on youtube we'd be looking to convert it into a podcast so you can also use it for meditations going forward um but um please feel free to use the code um to answer the question so blondie over to you thank you okay so i posted the code and the link on the chat box so if you can just copy it and just again, like Yusyama said, just make sure you let us know what kind of topics you want us to discuss going forward. So thank you everyone for coming. This brings us to the end of our very first session. I'm very happy. And um, Bibi, if you can just do a closing prayer for us and the priests will bless us as we close. Just before the closing prayer, just before the closing prayer, I just wanted to say to the audience, so we have um, people from our young and Catholic and a few people here in the UK who are helping us at the background so they didn't introduce themselves to set up this. And I think it's good to thank them for this session. We have the moderator who is a blondie. Um, she's, she lives in Canada. And then we have Isioma Koka, she's in Nigeria. Ibutemi Alaibe, she's in Nigeria. Um, Bibi Bankole, she's in Nigeria. Ifani um, Ajebo, he's here in London, but he lives in Nigeria. Nenda Chinda, she lives here in, in, in London. And then we also have a Niet Hamari. So we just have people who are working behind the scene and also getting this thing ready. So I thank you on behalf of Father Melke and Father Emmanuel for, for your sacrifice and all that you have done. God bless you. Baby, over to you. Hey, baby. I'm just trying to unmute, baby. Okay, I'm not sure it's Hi, working. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Yes. yes, I think it's okay. Okay, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this opportunity to share knowledge and our faith. We ask that you give us the strength and grace to hold steadfast unto you when bad things happen to us. We pray that you bless and sanctify this week. We bless our family and friends who have asked us to pray for them and those that are sick into your hands. We pray that you meet each and every one of them at the point of their needs through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Priest blessing. Father Melky. Lord be with you. Amen. Almighty God bless you all, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.